In the United States, there are approximately 554,000 homeless people, or about 0.17% of the total population. By comparison, Russia has approximately 5 million homeless people, or 3.4% of the population, and Germany has 800,000 homeless, or 0.5% of the population. While Russia tops the charts on homelessness for first world nations, the true chart topper is Egypt, with between 1 and 3 million homeless children alone. But have you ever wondered what it would be like to be homeless? Well, wonder no more as we dive into another special challenge episode of the Infographics Show and once more put our favorite guinea pig to the test for your scientific curiosity and task him with going homeless for 72 hours. Day 0 Ok, I probably should have been more prepared for this by now, but this challenge definitely caught me out of the blue. I've done I think maybe 20 challenges by now, and I should definitely have seen this one coming. Homeless for 3 days? Part of me is kind of excited because at least it's not a disgusting challenge and, well, it kind of feels like an urban version of man vs nature, right? There's a reason why there's so many of those wilderness survival shows on TV. I think deep down inside we all crave to know if we could really make it out there. Now the urban landscape isn't exactly the wilderness, but I know for a fact it can be pretty rough. I used to work security in Las Vegas for a little bit over a decade ago and I had to deal with the homeless population pretty frequently. Once we even had one homeless woman stab another homeless woman through the eye for apparently infringing on her territory because she was turning tricks at the casino I worked at. So yeah, I'm pretty well aware of the potential dangers of homelessness. When your survival comes down to working a turf of your own, well, it's no different than in the wild when prides of lions kill each other over the best hunting territory. Whether you're begging for loose change or turning tricks, holding and securing the ideal turf and protecting it at all costs can literally be the difference between life and death. Still, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I'm kind of excited to give this challenge a go. I have wilderness survival training from my past in the military, but there's a difference between a jungle or forest and the city streets. In a way, it actually seems more dangerous in city streets than it would ever be in the wild with a bunch of wild animals. I definitely trust wild animals more than I trust humans. So for this challenge, I'm going to do the real deal. I'll be leaving home with no money in my pocket and will be dropped off way on the other side of Los Angeles because I feel I should be in unknown territory, but also so I won't run into anyone I know. I'm taking the clothes on my back, two other changes of clothes in the backpack, and a bottle of water. I didn't want to take my phone with me, but the girlfriend begged and pleaded to take it just for emergencies, and I agreed. But I'll keep it turned off unless I run into an emergency I really can't handle on my own. I won't be taking a sleeping bag or anything like that. I'll have to scrounge for shelter, and with no money in my pocket, I'll be looking for ways to make some cash or, I guess, find some food. There's got to be about a billion legal liabilities regarding this whole challenge, but then again, this is the same show that made me not take a shower for a month and forced me to watch YouTube videos for 24 hours straight. I'm pretty sure the Allies sent a ton of Nazis to the gallows for similar inhumane experiments on concentration camp victims. I'll be updating at the end of my experience, but keep track of my days for later on pen and paper since I won't be taking a laptop, just a notebook and a few pencils. This challenge officially starts tomorrow morning at 5 am, when I'll be getting dropped off near downtown Los Angeles to begin my life as a homeless person. Wish me luck, and I'll see you in 72 hours. Unless I get stabbed to death with a rusty shank. End of Day 3 This is the end of my first and hopefully last bout of homelessness. And what an experience it's been. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I feel a million thoughts rushing up, so I'll just start back at the beginning. Like I planned, I got dropped off at 5 am, very near to downtown Los Angeles. But I didn't get breakfast and hadn't eaten since the night prior. Seemed only fair to start this challenge off with my first task being securing food. In case you don't remember, I didn't bring any money with me, and I had to figure out a way to feed myself. Well, I pretty quickly got a chance to do just that when I was walking past a 7-Eleven not far from where I'd gotten dropped off at. They were loading in pastries for the morning breakfast rush, but the truck driver and the two employees were inside and had left two racks of treats waiting to get pulled inside by the back door. Now, I consider myself a very honest person and I've never so much as shoplifted a candy bar. I think stealing is a pretty glaring moral shortcoming to be honest. But I reminded myself that I'm temporarily living a new life and had to start looking at things from the perspective of someone who didn't know where his next meal was coming from. Mostly because, you know, I didn't know where the hell my next meal was coming from. So I pried the plastic aside and swiped two donuts. Took like 3 seconds and I was well on my way down the block by the time anyone stepped out of the store. One thing they teach you during survival training is to exploit literally any advantage or windfall that you can. And I realized that after my donut heist, 
I started looking at the world in entirely different ways. I wasn't just a pedestrian walking along minding my own business anymore. I was actively watching my environment and looking for things I needed, food, water, shelter. The more time I spent on the streets, the more keen this instinct became, and eventually I realized that I was behaving the same way I'd had years and years ago in the middle of a northwest forest during survival training. Our regular lives are so insulated from the actual necessities of life, the things we need to keep ourselves safe and biologically alive, that when it's all stripped away, it's kind of a refreshing but extremely jarring experience. So my homeless strategy was to try and gradually make my way over toward the eastern half of Los Angeles from downtown. I thought that starting at downtown would be my best initial exposure to the whole homeless lifestyle because I got dropped off literally just a few blocks from LA's infamous Skid Row. This is a few blocks of downtown city streets that are completely awash with the homeless and some serious crime, and I wanted to experience what life was like there, but I wanted to keep on the move because it's probably not safe to hang around too long in Skid Row without knowing all the street rules. I spent most of the first day around Skid Row and I could already tell that trying to scrounge or even panhandle for money would be an absolute no-go here. There's just very little local traffic that isn't other homeless people or gang members, and anyone driving through is doing so with windows rolled up and car doors locked, and with very good reason. I wanted to stay on the move and not get wrapped up in any potential trouble, especially because I was drawing a lot of attention. I stupidly realized that I was drawing all this attention because I didn't look homeless. I was too fresh, my clothes too clean. I was standing out like a sore thumb, and believe me, that's not something you want to do on Skid Row. So I ducked into the nearest alley and rubbed my hands on the ground and then rubbed dirt on my face, hair, and clothes. I tore my jeans and shirt up a little bit, not much, but enough that it didn't look any more like I was wearing frequently laundered clothes. The trick worked and I quickly stopped getting stares and looks, which was good because not long after I ran into a group of three guys shaking down other homeless people. They stared me down at first, but I guess I was too young and in too good a shape for them to figure I was an easy mark and they ignored me, moving along to two other homeless men. They kind of dug through their assembled, well, what would be normally trash to you and me, but to them was all their belongings, but I guess they didn't find anything valuable and quickly went on their way. I had already learned the first rule of being on the streets, the strong shake down the weak, and the weak band together to fend off the strong. I've watched a ton of nature documentaries and it was amazing how similar to wild animals people really are. The first day I got really lucky and ran into a mission that was serving out hot meals at night, which was good because I'd gone totally bust on finding food all day. I'm not naive, and I knew that getting into what is essentially a survival situation means doing what it takes to survive, but the problem is that in this area there's no restaurants, supermarkets, nothing where you might be able to scrounge for food, and with no foot traffic panhandling was not an option. I got offered a place to stay the night of the mission, but I declined it and figured somebody in poorer health or older could probably use the place more than me. There was certainly not a lack of people in really bad shape. I struck east at night and ended up on the outskirts of downtown. I jumped a fence into an office park and managed to sleep for a few hours in an alcove by the loading dock to one of the buildings. Since the next day was Saturday, I knew nobody would be showing up for work. I've slept in the wilderness a ton before, sometimes without a sleeping bag, but knowing how close I was to Skid Row and everything I'd seen during the day, it was hard to get any sleep. The next day I was practically starving, having only eaten one bowl of soup and two donuts the day before. Also, my water was out. Finding a public restroom to refill my water bottle was easy enough, and I made up my mind to find a supermarket to go scrounge for food at. When I was a kid, one of my first jobs was at a supermarket, and I know for a fact that they throw away a ton of food still wrapped up and perfectly good for eating. I found three different supermarkets, but all of the bins were practically empty, and then I realized it was just too early in the day. Typically food gets thrown out around the afternoon. I didn't feel like waiting that long to eat, so I decided to answer a question that I've always wondered about. Just how much can you really make from panhandling? I found a promising spot with a lot of foot traffic and set up shop using a can I found in a dumpster. I made a grand total of 35 cents before a police car pulled up on the street in front of me and just sort of looked at me disapprovingly. I got the message and honestly didn't feel like adding a night in lockup to this challenge, so I left and moved on. Next I found a spot right on a freeway off ramp because I'd seen homeless people set up at spots like this all the time. It worked like a charm and in an hour I had already made $3.50, not exactly a king's ransom, but I was getting closer to be able to afford food again. Then two homeless guys started cursing and yelling at me because apparently I had taken their spot. Remember what I told you about being territorial? I left because I didn't want any trouble. 
But I'm going to be really honest with you here. If I were actually homeless, I know I would have stayed. I would have stood my ground and defended that spot with violence if I had to, because I had made over 10 times as much money there in an hour than I had in my previous spot. When you don't know where your next meal is coming from, prime real estate is a critical commodity. It also made sense why two guys worked that spot, with one working while the other rested, but also so that the two of them could better defend it against anyone intruding. Again, it's amazing how similar we are to wild animals. My good luck continued when I set up shop near the drive through to a fast food joint, and one of the employees actually called me over to the drive through window when they're not busy and gave me an entire meal in a bag. Now I've done my fair share of small kinds of deeds in my life, but I guess you never really appreciate just how much impact even something as small as buying someone a sandwich can have, until you're on the receiving end. I was absolutely starving by then and I had barely $4 to my name. That meal was a godsend. In the late afternoon, I made my way to the previous supermarkets but found other scroungers already there. I guess they'd figured out the schedule a long time ago, and I didn't feel like getting into another confrontation, so I skipped the first two supermarkets and hit the third one where there was only one other guy. With three dumpsters back there, we agreed he could have the one on the far left, I'd take the one on the right, and the one in the middle we'd split. I managed to find a Subway sandwich tray completely sealed in plastic that had been tossed, and after seeing that the expiration date hadn't yet come due, I honestly couldn't tell why it had been trashed in the first place. With a pretty substantial meal in hand, I let the other guy have the middle dumpster and what was left in mine, and he thanked me. As I sat eating, I thought about two things, the first being that I couldn't figure out why this perfectly wrapped up Subway sub tray had been tossed, and it wasn't the only thing. There were several other food items in that dumpster that were completely wrapped up and in perfectly fine shape but all had gotten tossed. When you picture homeless people dumpster diving for food, you probably think that they're eating gross stuff that's slimy and moldy and covered in unmentionable grime. But the truth is that the food you bring home from the market is exactly the same stuff that they eat. Yet some of it is expired, but expired definitely does not mean that most of the food is even close to starting to rot. It's an arbitrary date that I believe the FDA helped come up with. Most of the food though isn't anywhere close to the expiration date, but it might have some kind of unwanted visual blemish. For instance, it took me a bit, but I finally realized why my tray of sub sandwiches had been tossed. The top part of the plastic case had a large dent in it, and then it all made sense. How many times have you been at a supermarket and ignored the plastic tray of food because it had an unsightly dent in it? We all do it literally all the time, and with so much selection available to us, why take something so unsightly when we can get a tray that's perfectly unblemished instead? It's kind of insane, and from now on, I vowed to not overlook food items just because the packaging isn't perfect. The second thought I had was the difference between the homeless people I kept running into. The guy behind the supermarket was kind and polite, but the ones by the freeway off-ramp had definitely been aggressively protecting their territory. I guess it's about survival, but we're not all truly like wild animals. Some of us retain our humanity and cooperate, even help others. One guy I ran into on my second night, for instance, showed me where to refill my water bottle after all the places with public restrooms had closed down. He showed me where to get safe, clean water when I'd been planning on drinking the sprinkler water that is clearly labeled not for drinking. They do that so homeless people won't get sick, but you know what? When it's been a 100 degree day and you don't have many options available to you, you have to risk it sometimes. I managed to reach a rail yard on the second night, so I spent the night under a train car. I've read stories before of homeless people being crushed to death by moving train cars while they slept underneath them, so I made sure that this cart was totally disconnected from anything else and was on a piece of side track that was just out from the main line. Other than a train whizzing by in the middle of the night and scaring the piss out of me, almost literally, my night was pretty uneventful. By my third day, I managed to reach East Los Angeles and that meant that the neighborhoods were nicer and so was the general look and demeanor of the people. I learned from my first day and got up early enough to find a local 7-Eleven. Sure enough, an hour or so before sunrise, a truck showed up and started offloading pastries to sell to the morning breakfast crowd. Again, I'm no thief, but I was living temporarily in a different world, and when you're in a survival situation, there's only one rule, survive. Maybe it was because I was a lot hungrier than on the first day, or maybe because I finally knew how difficult finding food was and that I wasn't guaranteed a meal that day, but instead of snatching two donuts, I snatched as much as I could carry without being caught, then just slipped away. I was 100% breaking the law, but I was also in survival mode and to be honest, it was a little exhilarating, but mostly I was just hungry. The nicer neighborhoods meant nicer people, and I made over 10 bucks in about 5 hours of panhandling, which gave me almost 15 total dollars, or the ability to buy one meal. That's kind of discouraging, especially if you consider having to do this every day for weeks or months or even years on end. 
It makes sense why homeless people are so protective of the good panhandling spots though, and it really becomes hard to judge the two that chased me away a day before. Once more, this is about survival and I totally understand. My day was uneventful and mostly just boring. I made my way steadily eastward throughout the day, stopping at a fast food place to get a bite to eat. I ran across the library for the first time in decades, and I went inside to spend a few hours just reading their books. I got looks from people, and honestly it soon got really annoying. It wasn't just the library though. Throughout this experience, normal people have been giving me looks like I was untrustworthy, or like I was up to no good, or even a potential threat. It was really dehumanizing at one point, and the irony that in reality I'm a productive member of society that regularly pays his taxes and has a nice apartment only made things worse. These people literally knew nothing about me and had no idea that I was secretly one of them, but they treated me like I was basically a criminal. For the third night, I decided that I wanted to sleep a bit easier than I've been because by this point I was getting physically exhausted. So since I knew where I was in town, I made my way to a very fancy cemetery in the area with a big tall iron fence and security patrols inside the property. Civilian security is a joke, and I know from my experience in the military that even secure facilities have a weakness. So I just worked my way around the fence line into the tree line until I found a drainage ditch. The fence crossed the ditch, but because of flood risks had a small metal gate that swung outward at the bottom. So during heavy rains, branches and other debris could flow out and not back up at the fence and eventually bring the whole thing down. Even though Los Angeles hadn't had a major rain in over a year, the gates had been, of course, left open, so it was simple enough to just crawl through them. Several thousands of dollars of cameras along the fence line and two full-time security patrols completely defeated because some guard had been lazy over a year ago and never closed the drainage gate. Like I said, civilian security is a joke. I kinda kicked the gates closed to keep anyone else from following in and then found a pretty peaceful spot to sleep undisturbed until morning. Sadly, no ghosts or zombies appeared, but I did sleep until well into sunrise and realized that I was supposed to call the girlfriend at 5am on the dot to let her know where to pick me up and that I was safe. When I turned on my phone, it was already well past 7, and when she picked up the phone, she was furious and also completely distraught. I guess I don't blame her. Last time she saw me was three days ago on the outskirts of Skid Row, a place so dangerous they literally make documentaries about how you should never go down there. Then she hadn't heard from me at all. When she finally picked me up an hour later, she told me she had nearly called the cops and yelled at me for not calling at exactly 5 like I promised. In between yelling, she cried. I guess these three days were as nerve-wracking for her as they were for me. What did I learn from my experience on the streets? A lot. Too much for this episode, and experienced a lot of things that honestly don't quite fit into the more family-friendly aspect of our show. The biggest thing I learned though is how far small gestures of kindness really go. So when you do one of these gestures for somebody in need, don't ever undervalue just how much that really meant. Buying someone a meal may set you back 10 bucks. Not a big deal for the vast majority of us, but for someone hungry who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from, that's hot food in their belly and the stress of finding something to eat relieved for the next 12 hours. You can't put a price on that. The other thing I learned is that living on the streets is dangerous and some people are predators, but a lot of other people aren't. I saw homeless guys giving other homeless guys their spare change or parts of their food. Some kind soul helped me find a drinking source that wouldn't make me sick. Lots of people on the street are looking to take advantage of others and prey on them, but many more are willing to help others out. And underneath that dirt and grime, there's a real person that isn't plotting how to hurt you or steal from you, and that you shouldn't be scared of. Sometimes, simply treating them like a normal human being and giving them a little respect is the biggest charitable act you could do. How would you survive for three days out in the streets? Let us know in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.